There's probably nothing that's happened in recent medicine in the last two decades that has been surrounded by swirling myths and misinformation than the concept of using testosterone in middle-aged and older men. In the next few minutes, I hope to be able to dispel some of those misinformations that I think will present a case for the use of testosterone in symptomatic men who have low testosterone levels. I'd like to begin my presentation by telling you a story that happened to me not too long ago on a recent trip to Dallas, Texas. I arrived late in the evening and a young bellman, 18 to 20 years of age, takes my bags, places it on the edge of the bed. I reach into the, my pocket to give the man a tip, and I find that I only have 32 cents in change. So I said to him, let me unzip my bags. I got a great idea. Let me give you a copy of my new book, best-selling book, not quite on the New York Times list, but a best-selling book called Impotence, It's Reversible. So the young man, he looks at the book, he looks back at me. He looks down and sees who the author is. He says, are you Dr. Baum? I said, why, yes. He says, well, if it's OK with you, he says, I'll just take the 32 cents. <laughs> now, I tell you that story because hopefully in the next half hour, Dr. Ewing, 40 minutes, in the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes, Dr. Ewing and I will be able to give you a compelling story about the safety of using testosterone in middle-aged men who are symptomatic for hypogonadism. So what do we want to accomplish in the next few minutes? I'm going to give you a brief medical student review of the hypothalam hypothalamus pituitary testis axis. I'm going to discuss briefly the symptoms of hypogonadism. I'll review the evaluation of low testosterone. Got it? Yeah, wow. OK. Let's give it up. Give them a hand. Thank you. <laughs> made, our, made our life easier. Thank you for coming back. That was very nice of you. Uh, review the evaluation of men with low testosterone and discuss the controversies surrounding hormone replacement therapy, and then Dr. Ewing is going to talk about suggestions for monitoring patients with, for, who are on hormone replacement therapy. Now let me ask you a question. If I could do, and Dr. Ewing and myself could do all of that in 30 to 40 minutes, would that be, could, would that be considered a successful presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Not only would it be considered successful, Dr. Caputo, Dr. Caputo, it would be magical. Just the first one. Hold on, hold on to your seats, there's more coming. No, this is what we want to accomplish in the next few minutes. There's 14 million American men who are suffering from low testosterone. Unfortunately, only 6% are being treated. And the number is going down because of the poor publicity that has been received around the use of hormone replacement therapy. It's very common. 20% of people over the age of 60 have it. And as it's a disease of aging, and the older you get, the more likely you are to be symptomatic for low testosterone. For this presentation, we will use the numbers for a normal testosterone between 300 uh, nanograms per deciliter and 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. You all remember this. Nothing has changed from your medical school days where you know that the uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH. It is LH that stimulates the lytic cells in the testicle and with a negative feedback mechanism, 
is able to shut off uh, the production of testosterone. I'll talk with you a little bit about the diurnal rhythm that occurs with testosterone, and I'll talk with you about the different kinds of testosterone. Uh, the, these are the target organs. It is not just the Leydig cells. There are other organs in the body that have androgen receptors, and this can result in some of the symptoms associated with low testosterone. Testosterone in normal males consists of the free testosterone. This is the most active part of testosterone, the free testosterone, which is converted to dihydrotestosterone inside the cell. That only makes up 2% of the total testosterone. The majority is made up of loosely bound to uh, albumin, and then there is 30% that is tightly bound to the glycoprotein sex hormone binding globulin, and this testosterone is not available to cellular uh, physiology and cellular function. It is so tightly bound that it cannot penetrate the cell because of the large size of the testosterone and the sex hormone binding globulin. As I mentioned, hypogonadism is a disease of aging. The older you are, the more likely in normal people for the testosterone level to significantly decrease. There is, as there is a decrease in free testosterone and total testosterone with age, there is a concomitant increase in sex hormone binding globulin. So a man, older man, can have a normal total testosterone, but because his sex hormone binding globulin is elevated, he may have symptoms of hypogonadism because as I mentioned, the tightly bound testosterone to sex hormone binding globulin cannot get in the cell. What else makes the sex hormone binding globulin increase? Primarily, it is aging. I also forgot to put on there obesity. Obesity also increases sex hormone binding globulin plus these other causes. These are the signs of low testosterone. Dr. Ewing will uh, enumerate and uh, expand on this shortly. But primarily what brings people in is decrease in libido, decrease in erections, and also uh, lethargy, lack of energy, lack of productivity. So these are the things that bring a man into the office asking for help. So what is the workup? The workup is easy. It's a total testosterone. Uh, if the uh, testosterone is the lower limit of normal, then I would get a free uh, testosterone. And this gives you the bioavailable testosterone. Testosterone plus that which is loosely bound to albumin is what can get into the cells. For people who do not respond to treatment, then there may be a possibility that they have an excess of sex hormone binding globulin. And certainly for all men who have a significant number that we, numbers we're using are 300 to 1,000, those who have a significant decrease, that is less than 100 nanograms per deciliter, need to check a prolactin level to rule out a pituitary tumor. Uh, prolactin secreting pituitary tumor. Recommend drawing the testosterone level in the morning. The reason is between 8 and 12 o'clock, you can see that testosterone is at the highest level. Uh, as men get older, it, there is a blunting of the diurnal variation, but ideally the testosterone level should be drawn in the morning uh, between 8 and 10. <coughs> Regarding the screening of asymptomatic